Okay, well, thanks for joining today. And, and this is not the first time I'm doing this, but actually in this format it is. So it's kind of it's nice for me to be able to get to kind of present what we do in terms of development studies and our online program in particular, but I teach on the um, on campus development studies programs. And I just thought I would give a very broad topic today, the politics of development in an increase, increasingly unequal world. Um, and uh, first of all, this is who I am. Um, Nav Tej, or Tej as I'm, I'm called for a while. I am a professor of political sociology at SOAS. Um, and I have been in the Department of Development Studies. This is um, my second year in Development Studies. Uh, before that, um, I actually was a graduate of SOAS in 1992. I, I came from the US to study kind of development studies, area studies um, then. And then after all these years, I came back in 2014 and became the deputy director of the South Asia Institute at SOAS. And we have a number of regional institutes and, and that one. Uh, and I now am the convener of the MSc International Development uh, Program in Development Studies, which is a new program, but is one of the larger, I believe, programs in, in SOAS, where I teach the core module, uh, Political Economy and Sociology of Development uh, on, online. I'm also, actually, I don't have that here, but <laughs> I'm also uh, convening a new module in October, which is going to be on um, the politics of gender and feminism in development, which is actually going to be leading into some of the things I'll be talking about today. And on campus, I also teach the undergraduate first year module, Introduction to Global Development, and then our on campus gender and development. I'm involved in a lot of kinds of kind of team um, modules at SOAS as well. So you can see. Um, you know, the, there's a breadth that we offer and we, we kind of do a lot of that kind of team teaching, which I think makes adds a lot of richness to the kinds of materials that you, those of you who are thinking of coming to SOAS or already at SOAS can, can get an idea of. I work on structural violence and inequality. So um, I'm, I'm really interested in the structural factors and what uses inequality and not seeing inequality as a byproduct of development. Um, I also, and so it's asking, asking questions like, why does the 1%, you'll see this data around, why does the, the wealthiest 1% in the world own 50% of the world's assets and resources? Um, we might even, in the coming year, we're going to be looking much more at race, um, racialization processes. And I also teach on um, racial capitalism. And this last year, obviously, Black Lives Matter has become, is not something new where we looked at the 13th Amendment and histories of migration, of slavery, and how they become embedded into how um, places that you think are developed, like the United States, actually are shaping international development policy. And those are the kinds of interesting ways that we like to think about it, and, uh, that it's not just about this formerly colonized third world global south, but looking at the dominant as well and hegemonic parts of the world and how they actually structure um, inequality too. Um, so I'm interested in, in a number of different questions, biopolitics, reproductive rights, population, structural violence, race. I've written a book you can see here in the bottom that came out last year, which was on the India-Pakistan border and looking at religion and caste. So um, I'm quite interdisciplinary and I hope, um, you know, if the, those of you who are interested in the online program can see what that actually, how that comes into the teaching on the core module. So here are a couple, some debates in development studies that you might find interesting, um, or just to give you an, an idea of how, how I approach this in, in the module in particular of, of the MSE International Development. Um, and I, I might do this by, and you might want to ask at the end um, or in between, is what some of the debates in development studies, how they get presented in a kind of more mainstream, I will say, way, um, and how we might think critical about it through structures. So it's rather than being an outcome about it in terms of structures. So the first question is, what do different measurements and indicators of poverty and inequality tell us? And importantly, what do they conceal? Right, so we'll, we'll, I'll be showing you a couple of graphs in a moment to kind of get, give you an idea. What, what are we looking for? What, the people who produce this data and this graph, what are they trying to com communicate to us? And what does it say? And what might it not be showing? Um, the second point is, does neoliberalism represent the triumph of capitalism? And if so, what is neoliberal development? You know, uh, is, it a, is it an oxymoron? How can you put capital development to side by side? And what does it produce? 
third is development by definition colonial and can it be decolonized? Um, and if you're aware about the decolonized um, the curriculum movement, of course, the statues, mobilizations around bringing down statues is all connected to the coloniality of this idea of, of, of what development also is. Um, and we're engaging with that actively too in our curriculum. And then finally, how is gender instrumentalized in development discourse and policy? So these are questions which aren't necessarily right, I'm saying, but when we pose, we could look at all of these kinds of areas in slightly different ways. We might look at them in terms of thinking more practically about using a particular, um, I don't know, policy instrument to measure. We might, we might look at why is gender important or why is gender equality important as opposed to why, how and why is gender instrumentalized. And I'll, I'll hopefully be hinting to you here why the way we pose these questions, why that, how that, how that actually gets down to the next level of, of the structures. So our core module in the MSE International Development covers a range of topics, and I'm not going to go through those here. I just want to give you a, a background and idea around how we don't take the, the idea of development at face value. It's actually questioning what it means. And actually, there's a huge emphasis on ideology as well. You know, SOAS is known for critical perspectives, and we have, we, have to, we have to do that. And it's not to say we only will show supposedly radical approaches. We'll also talk about neoclassical and you know, other kinds of more mainstream approaches. And we also look at capitalism as a system. But of course, we analyze it very critically. And we also look at it in terms of global institutions, in terms of policies, in terms of social movements and change. Um, and then, of course, kind of unpacking it for in terms of the colonial backdrops of, of, of development, which, of course, SOAS is known for also having very strong ties to it, having been set up as a colonial training school. Um, and now in its contemporary context in the 21st century, you know, SOAS is playing a different kind of role now in terms of, you know, that we have, a lot, you know, uh, these students coming from all over the world, you know, faculty who've come from all over the world, who come from the countries that we're actually studying also. So there's that way of approaching development that we, we, we kind of pride ourselves on that, on, on the diversity of perspectives. So what I wanted to do today was actually highlight um, an area of mine, which is looking at, at gender in development. And you might have heard of all of the acronyms of women in development, women and development, gender and development, so WID, WAD, GAD, lots of acronyms, which actually show how institutionalized gender policies have become. It's become what many people have called a common sense that, you know, gender equality makes sense for everyone, that it should be something that every country, all policies should be implementing and, draw and working towards. Um, so I'm just going to like highlight a few of the kind of ways in which we might up this. One is um, is thinking about how gender has historically featured in development interventions, which has a slightly more uh, cynical or maybe even sinister uh, view on on gender as how in terms of how it's mobilized. The second is actually questioning and challenging universal principles, the universalization of those kinds of you know high level. Um, so, for instance, the final point here I have on CEDAW, the Platform for Action, 1995, you know, trying to ratify, trying to bring, get countries to sign up to um, universal principles is, can on the one hand sound very good for global agendas, and in terms of local agendas, and also for local, you know, progressive movements or women's organizations or feminist movements, who are trying to question the, the status quo, that can also have detrimental impacts. And that, that's a, those are kinds of places that we would like to also engage with. Um, what does mainstreaming gender signify in the Millennium De Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals? Um, you know, what does it mean to mainstream gender across the, 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 the goals that, that, have, that, we, that we see, we yeah, have kind of seen ubiquitously um, globally? And then my four, the fourth point here is trying to understand the backdrop of neoliberalism and the West rising to this position of money within the international institutions. Um, very interestingly, as you can see, as the COVID situation is evolving, we've seen international institutions like the WHO um, 
being questioned, you know, funding threatening, you know, member countries who have been historically funding and were part of the establishment of organizations are now threatening to cut funding. Um, and, and that says a lot about the kind of ways in which the kind of post-World War II context of development and the development of those institutions, like the World Bank, WHO, the World Food Program, so many different institutions that emerged as being the kind of agents of development or coordinated international development are now finding themselves being marginalized by the nation states who've been, who have been um, funding them. And it says a lot about how the global stage is not, um, it's not an empty kind of canvas. It's a place where ideological battles are also fought. And gender is very much a part of that. Let me see the next slide. There we go. Okay, so if we look at gender across time and think about capitalism and policy discourse, this is an important kind of, I think, three images to maybe consider what this would mean. The first is obviously on the left looking at um, the advertisement from the Ceylon Tea Company. And here it's, you know, you can see, you can obviously, this is, we're not doing a kind of analysis of the image in itself, but if you look at the kind of rhetoric and the kind of ways it's trying to mark two cups in one, it's kind of marketing the, um, by, and also looking at the worker, I'm looking at the female worker here, who's someplace in, you know, what is now Sri Lanka, you know, produce strength, flavor, aroma, and purity is celebrating these products that are being produced, the resources, the raw materials that are emerging out of the imperial colonial um, plantation economy. To the right-hand side um, of the women who, again, working, um, you can see the tea leaves in their hands are showing and looking as though they're having a good time working, but they're also working in the tea plantations. And looking at that regime of production, the way that it, it's almost a seamless um, kind of continuity across, which is in both of these images, instrumentalizing gender, where um, capitalism, you know, was driving uh, the colonial endeavor to go and find new resources, new markets, and women were not always seen as victims. They were in being included through the civilizing mission, of course, in terms of banning certain cultural uh, practices. So in this context, in the South Asian context, we'd see the banning of practices of, such as child marriage or dowry or bride burning or female infanticide. The late 19th century had many uh, kinds of uh, legal interventions that were there to kind of show that the British colonial state was bringing civilization to these parts of the world while the economy was re being reshaped and, and it was being reshaped and uh, molded for the global political economy which was, of course, under the colonial direction. Now, if we say that these two may show some continuities, if you look on the bottom right, we look at this as being, this, this is also part of the Unilever advert as the same as above, which is also tagging on the SDGs. So a company, a multinational corporation like Unilever is simultaneously um, tapping into, and it's part of, part of the continuity of the colonial, colonial economy, as we know, but it's also part of the global um, discourse on, on um, sustainability. Um, it's not talking about gender explicitly here in terms of the SDGs it mentions, but it's certainly instrumentalizing the idea of gender and, and women as workers and, and, and bringing them into the, as, uh, into the economy as active um, contributors to the economy. So in another context, we might look at biopolitics. And um, these are kind of some theoretical ideas which we apply to different places in the world. Okay, so this is an area of research that I've done, which is looking at the sex selection, uh, sorry, the sex ratio. And behind that is this idea that sex selection, uh, the performance of um, sex selective abortions might be resulting in a, a an increasing um, uh, masculine sex ratio and this this line here shows us um, on the bottom on the in the graph that as the total population um, average is kind of showing an Im improvement in terms of the sex ratio 
we can see that at the age of zero to six, it's going down. Now, why the, am I why am I showing you this? What I'm, the reason I'm showing it because it's actually a very stark example of intervention. So when we think about development and intervention, oftentimes you'll think, okay, this is social policy. We're looking at a post-2000 Washington consensus point where the human face of capitalism was being um, implemented through social ministries of social development. So most countries ended up setting up in some form or another, some form of social development if they didn't already have these bodies. And in the Indian context, the, the ministries of social development and the departments for women and, and, and child care became part of the kind of projection of this idea of the girl child. And it dated back to 1990 when UNICEF, you can see the stamp there, you know, set, set up the, the decade for the girl child where it was identified that the girl child is the most deprived, the most excluded, whose life chances were um, the most depleted. Um, and therefore the, the state came in and said, we will through a number of different regimes, we can't, don't have time here to explain, but um, to, to come in and make certain interventions. And the places at which this intervention took place were in 1994 and 2003. And those are the, that point where we see the two lines crossing is where we see the interventions actually having a negative effect. So as the state comes in and criminalizes, um, for instance, sex selective abortion, um, you can see that, in fact, the practice is likely to have, have, have occurred in more underground co ways. Um, on the other hand, we see on the top, there's a banking scheme that the government introduced. It started in 2015, um, which is called Save the Girl Child, Educate the Girl Child, um, which brought in the private banking system um, as natural partners. And so this is an example of neoliberalism at its, so it's bringing together biopolitics, the state control population, but it's also bringing in private actors, such as the private banking sector in India, to incentivize the birth of girl children by giving a payment at the time of birth to the parents at the point when she would be carrying on with her education from the age of 10 to 11 before she'd go, which is the, the dropout rate where it's the highest at the age of 10, 11. And then finally, age of 18, when girls would be either, either 18 or 21, when they'd be at the age of, of marriage. Um, and the, the scheme very clearly showed that this was going to be the state's contribution to the dowry, which is seen as, you know, which is the kind of cultural uh, or the gender uh, kind of um, ways in which women are tied to patrimony. So it's not progressive. It's not arguing we're going to end dowry. It's actually working culture and very gendered notions of, of the half family and, and womanhood all into capitalism. And this is, um, this is really what we're looking at now. And so the picture becomes very muddled when we see that neoliberal development are, is now, um, it's now a thing. <laughs> it's now a concept which is here, there, and everywhere. So when corporations are also on board, are on board, NGOs are having to look for funding, we can see that it's a very mixed picture. And when we think about neoliberal development, to just give you a, a um, a definition about what that is, the neoliberal turn, it's the withdrawal of the state from welfare and a shrinking role of the state in terms of provision of public health care, education and social services. So the state over the last few decades through structural adjustment, um, through a number of other packages which have seen a real kind of overhauling of the post-colonial state, the state that, post-colonial state that had been you know, struggling in many ways to recover from colonialism and to build national economies is now being shrunk even further. And so here we see a heightened presence of private forces in traditionally public realms. And it's here that the neoliberal state can often <coughs> also take on repressive features. So Another example, and I'm, I'm sure most of you would have heard of this before, um, the number of kind of corporate social responsibility campaigns where corporations are actually required to show that they're doing something for a society. And so corporate social responsibility, CSR, is, is people would say is a way for corporations or otherwise, you know, doing things very unethically are able to funnel their um, uh, profits into 
work that does is doing good for society. So on the left, you can see the kind of sweatshop. There's a doc there many documentaries on that. Um, the Clean Clothes Campaign, for instance, is another, um, which highlight the ways in which you know trainers, um, other kinds of you know apparel are produced in sweatshop contexts, uh, in special economic zones where labor laws are not abided to, where trade unions are illegal, and where uh, labor is seen feminine labor is further feminized but also undervalued um, and 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 this these are the places where corporations are also maximizing their profits but then that simultaneously also be seen to engaging to be engaging in the campaign that common sense I mentioned before of girls being the, the likely you know and this this image here on the right as being the key symbol for development. Not all, not all of the slides are showing here. I'm sorry there, I had another image, but it's not there. Okay, that's all right. Um, so there, there are a number of things when we look at, I mean, I've kind of given you some examples that are out there in the world in terms of corporations, the, the neoliberal context that, that is really everywhere. Neoliberalism as a concept is capitalism in its, you know, in its kind of sharpened, heightened state, but it is the system. Um, and so for those of us who are studying development, um, and we do study dependency theory and structuralism, a number of different competing frameworks, but what we're finding increasingly is that we are operating within a neoliberal global uh, context, and therefore we need to share our tools and our skills for, for, in order to be able to understand, you know, how do we work um, in this system in addressing structures that underlie the politics of development? So there are historical connections um, and relations of power between the what's so-called global north and global south and lots of different other terminologies depending on how you are mapping whatever dynamics you're looking at. So empire, coloniality, they haven't gone away. Um, and many economies are still locked into producing raw materials on very unfair and uneven terms of trade. We also see economic and political institutions that have been historically aligned to states that benefited from colonization. Um, and you can, we can see the ways in which many countries are still paying back debts that are tied to those histories, um, which are accumulating interest. Um, and how that impacts on the ways in which you know, any kind of any country is able to do its own planning. We also are interested then in looking at the social dynamics, so class, race, gender, um, and how social dynamics are also a key site for the reproduction of inequality. Um, we can see. we can see a persistence of systemic processes as a result. So when we don't question the underlying politics or the underlying structures, then we're all we're doing is making a superficial kind of um, intervention, which will just continue to reproduce and perpetuate those. And I think that probably, if I wanted to say in a nutshell, kind of talks about um, you know, how and why doing a critical approach towards development and not just doing development studies, but doing understanding it through the, the political economy and the politics of development is absolutely essential. So um, I'm just going to now briefly just talk about the, the program in particular. Um, you know, why study development studies at us and, and why do it online? I've got an image here of our lovely Senate House. And we're hoping, well, it's going to be due to be opening again soon in the next couple of weeks, um, is, is that our online programs reflect the kinds of critical approaches and perspectives um, the same, in the same way that our programs on campus do. Um, we have a really good pedagogy, I think, in terms of the distance learning, which um, I mean, you're free to ask afterwards about how it works with distance learning is that people are all over the world um, and the we work with a, an assumption that uh, people are based and might be busy at different at, the, at different times um, or available at different times so that you are able to benefit from being in that kind of um, in that learning space um, so we have really you know the we have a global network of students 
uh, many of whom are already working in international development and are working while they're studying also. And I think that also enriches the engagements and inter interactions in terms of our discussion forums that you participate in. That people are coming from lots of different geographical places, but also from very different points of perception um, in terms of understanding the problems at hand that, we're, that we think about. Overall, it's a, it's a guided curriculum, um, if I had to just in, in any way, with flexible self-learning. And it's through this then that we set up a, a kind of structure through our um, the, you know, virtual learning environment where it's activities, which are basically assignments or assessments, which are broken down as kind of building blocks. Um, and they eventually, as we've seen you know, very successfully, that students become equipped very quickly with very good analytical and written skills. OK, so I've kind of rushed through that. Um, I, I wanted to just give you a taste of some of the kinds of questions that we look at, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if anyone has.